we've been talking about uh, managing complexity. We talked about using documentation as a way of, or sorry, using inline code comments as a way of helping people understand our code. We've talked about using static analysis tools like linters and uh, automatic code formatting to make it possible for a lot of people to work on the same code base and have a consistent approach to writing the code. And today I want to talk about another idea, and that is how we use testing and continuous integration as a way of making sure that we don't break existing code, we don't cause regressions, that we don't introduce bugs, that we continue to ship a product that uh, does all of the things that we expect it to do. So I'm assuming that some of you have done some testing in the past. I know that if you've worked with me in other courses, you've probably uh, run into me talking about tests or making you do tests because I'm a huge fan of testing. Testing is something that I really enjoy. Um, it's sort of a, it's <laughs> sort of a, it's like playing a video game uh, where you're trying to get your code to pass and you know, the rules are really clear and um, well, anyway, we'll come back to that. So if you haven't done any testing before, what I wanted to do, first of all, is I just wanted to define some terms, give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about. And then what I'm going to do is I've written a tool and I've put all the code online so you can get it later. So I wrote a command line tool and then I have written tests, a whole bunch of different tests for it. And I want to take you through and show you how I would deal with testing different aspects of working with this with this tool. Okay, so we're going to be talking about all different kinds of tests, unit tests, integration tests, etc. Like I, I have a tweet here, um, you know, two unit tests, zero integration tests. And, you know, we're going to learn about the different use, use cases for different types of testing, whether we're testing an individual unit of code or whether we're testing the whole product and the way that the whole program integrates together and how data flows from one end to the other. And so there's lots of famous memes where, you know, people have tested one little piece of their code, but they haven't tested the whole thing. And when you try, try it in, uh, in you know, this one is a good example. So let's go through some important concepts here. The, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea of having a test suite. So when we, when we write tests, what we're doing is we aren't trying to write one single program that does everything that our program can do. Before you start testing, you might be tempted to think, you know, all I need to do is I need to find a way to um, make my program do everything once and make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. And so lots of us, before you learn about testing, we'll have some manual way that we test things. You know, you'll go to the command line, you'll run a couple commands, and you'll look at the output and say, okay, yeah, it's still working. So a test suite is where we have all kinds of tests that we're going to run together. We have a collection of tests that we're going to run together as a whole. And so when I, when I talk about a test suite, I mean all of your tests, all different kinds of tests, all running together. So when we're when we're going to write tests, we need to have a test runner. And there's all depending on the language that you're using, this is going to look very different. But the idea of a test runner is that it can discover and run your tests for you. So there's a number of things about a test runner that are sort of ideal and that you should know about or you should look for when you're working on finding one. So you need to be able to run all of your tests really easily, like a single command runs all your tests you need to be able to run a single test. This is really important because sometimes if you're working on a piece of code, you want to run the same test over and over and over again while you're trying to figure out what's wrong. You don't want to run 8,000 other tests because it's going to be it's going to take too long to do it. Uh, a test runner should be able to watch for changes in your source code. So as you're working on the source code, if something changes, the tests can be automatically rerun. And it's a great way to have a feedback loop so that you can set up and see, okay, if I make this change, what does it mean for, for my tests? Ideally, you can run these tests in parallel. So the tests, you could have four different tests all running at the same time. They're all isolated from each other. That's great. You should be able to run it from the command line and you should be able to run it by integrating it into your editor or into your IDE. So that's the test runner. So now when we're talking about a test suite and a test runner, it implies the idea of a test. So 
When we talk about a test, a couple of things for you to keep in mind. The first is that tests should be independent of each other. So the order that you run your tests should never matter. So this is a critical idea when you're thinking about how you're gonna write these things. We're gonna write tests that are gonna be small and they're gonna be independent. So not only should they be independent of each other, tests should also be independent as much as possible of the environment in which they are run. So we don't want something where um, our test is running inside an environment and something changes and now our test fails for some reason. So in a, in a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about how we can overcome this problem by using what are called mocks. So another thing we should say about tests is that they should be small and they should test the simplest and the fewest things possible. Um, so I would suggest to you that you wanna have lots of tests and you wanna have smaller tests rather than a few big tests. Um, ideally, you're testing little, as much as you can, you're testing little things and those things are independent of each other. We'll come back to what this looks like in practice. Another important idea about a test is that a test should always produce the same result given a particular input, given a particular uh, piece of code or test data. So your tests shouldn't have any side effects. In other words, if I run a test, it shouldn't affect running the same test again. Um, everything should be the same. Everything should be reset to the same level, so there's not gonna be a problem. Now, some other things, I brought in some more tweets uh, that I wanted to talk about. So here's one that I saw, uh, Dave Townsend, who uh, works on Firefox, and he, he wrote what I thought was a really interesting tweet. Wondering what folks think is the average ratio for writing tests versus a thing for a thing versus implementing the thing. And he says, he guesses that it's five to one. So in other words, it takes five times longer to write the test than it does to implement it. So this is gonna be maybe a shocking idea to you, but Tests are often harder to write than the code that they test. And there's often more code in your tests than there is in whatever it is that you're testing. The implementation be, can be quite small, but the test is gonna have to go and deal with a, a lot of different cases. And we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk about why that is. So another idea about tests, when we talk about you know, tests are going to be, there's going to be lots of them and you're going to make lots and lots of tests. Another thing that you got to be careful of is you don't get carried away. So here's another tweet. Write tests, not too many, mostly integration. That's a good tweet. Uh, here, we have to think about tests as code and all of the code that we write has to be maintained. So the more tests you write, the more code you're going to have to maintain, you're gonna to have to debug those tests. And the, one of the jokes is, you know, do you write tests for your tests? <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes you have to. But ideally you wanna be careful that you don't have your tests grow to become something that you're spending all of your time maintaining. The test should help you maintain your code. You shouldn't have to work to maintain your tests. So, you, so there's some, there's some trade-offs here. So a way of thinking about tests is that tests are really like a kind of documentation for a project. So a test says, this is how the, this is how the program works. This is how we believe the program should work. And it's a contract, it's a spec. So oftentimes people coming to open source or really big software projects are surprised that there aren't more, that there aren't, there isn't more documentation. However, there'll be thousands and thousands of tests, and what they don't understand is that developers prefer tests to documentation because the tests can be run and the tests can be checked. So we have a way of writing highly technical documentation, that's really what tests are, that, that go through all of our code and make sure that things do whatever it is that they're supposed to do. However, I have one last tweet here, and that, uh, this one here by Russ Cox, he says, have you ever read a program and you think, this is full of bugs, how could it possibly have ever worked? And the answer is almost always because it was tested. The inputs that mattered were tested and bugs affecting those got fixed, but new inputs find new bugs and require new fixes. So one of the things that I want to make sure you're aware of is the fact that tests don't tell you whether or not your program is bug free. This is tempting because you're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to write really good tests 
but you can't rely on those tests to catch all of your bugs. So there's a, a kind of testing that we also do called fuzz testing, which throws data at a program that is computer generated, data that no human would ever create. And what it does is it finds really interesting crashes, out of memory errors, places where we do the wrong thing, because we never think to throw the kind of garbage at our programs that can actually happen with corrupted data or something happening on the network, etc. Okay, so some other ideas that I want to, just terminology that I want to use. So another one is this idea of a code path. So if you think about uh, a function that you're writing and it has an if and an else, what you're ending up with is you're ending up with these two code paths. So when we're writing tests, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to exercise all of those code paths. So in other words, I'm trying to find a way through my program that goes through all of the paths. Obviously, it's not possible to go into the if and the else at the same time. So it's going to be it's going to be necessary for me to write multiple tests, one that goes in the if, one that goes in the else, etc. And I'm going to have to figure out ways to get my code to all run and to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. Okay, so how do I write tests that do this? What we do is we use what are generally called assertions. So an assertion is a way of saying this should be true. Here is, here's a variable, here's a function, here's an expression, and this should be true of it. It should be a string, or this should be a number greater than a thousand, or this array should contain four items. Those are all things we can write assertions for, and we can, we can assert that something is true. So a test goes through, runs our code, and it checks to see that certain things, it asserts that certain things are true. Okay, we use assertion libraries or frameworks that go by different names in order to achieve this. So we have to write all kinds of complex tests, all kinds of complex assertions, and there's lots of libraries that do this. For example, does this array include this value or does this string match this regular expression? There's lots of fancy syntax that we can get for doing this and different languages and different libraries have, have different ways of doing it, but you're gonna see they all have some way of doing this. Okay, two more ideas before we get into our code. The next one is the idea of mocks. So I mentioned this earlier, I said that a test should be, as much as possible, it should be independent from the environment in which it runs. That's very hard to achieve because think about it, you're running in a computer, you're running on a particular piece of hardware, you're running on a, a particular version of an operating system, you're using a particular version of a compiler, uh, you know, like it, it goes on and on and on. It's very difficult to isolate these things. However, we can isolate certain things by making pretend versions of them. So if you can imagine testing a web application where you have to talk to a database, you have to connect to things over a network, you have to read and write files to disk, all of those things can be simulated. We don't actually need to talk to a real database, we just need to make it look like we talk to a database. So one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna isolate parts of our program such that we can test it, but test it against mock implementations or fake implementations something that looks enough like a database or enough like the network or enough like the file system to be able to achieve our goal, but we don't have to necessarily use the real thing because using the real thing would be too expensive or the real thing might fail sometimes. For example, if you're connecting to a host over the network and the network goes down, all of a sudden your unit tests fail. That's not great. The last term that I'm gonna mention here that will be coming up in the rest of what I'm gonna be looking at is this idea of coverage. So coverage or code coverage is a way for us to measure which lines of code were visited or touched or which code paths did we go through when we ran our tests. We're gonna use code coverage information in order to know whether or not we need to write more tests or whether or not we're testing all aspects of um, the code that we're working on. Okay, so that's the theory. Let's let's go a little deeper. So let me, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do an, a live example with you today. And most of, the, most of you are working in JavaScript, so I'm gonna do it in JavaScript. 
But everything I'm going to talk about now, you can do in Python, you can do in Java, you can do in C++, you can do in C Sharp, you can do all of these different languages have a way of doing what we're about to do. So the, the names of the tools will be slightly different, the syntax will be slightly different, but the ideas are going to be the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to spend a ton of time teaching you the syntax of what I'm doing. Instead, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the ideas of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, okay? And then you'll be able to hopefully abstract that into whatever language you're going to be working on. So I'm going to use a testing framework that I really like called Jest. And this is an open source project that came out of Facebook. And it's well maintained and really well documented. And because Facebook uses it, they've used it in a million different ways. And they've developed lots of good tools for it. You can use it to test all sorts of things, Node apps, React apps, whatever. I'm going to use it to test a Node, a node app. And let me just show you some really simple code here to get us started. OK, so here's the idea. The idea is that I have a piece of code um, that I want to test, like this little function here. I have a function called sum. And this is inside of a module called sum.js. So it's part of my program. And let's say I'm building a big program, and it's a calculator program, for example. And one of the modules in there is the sum module. Well, I could test the entire program. And if I did that, we'd call it integration testing or acceptance testing or end-to-end -end testing. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to focus just on this one function. I'm going to focus on the sum function inside sum.js. So how does this function work? It takes two arguments and it returns a plus b. So fairly, fairly simple piece of code. And what we can do is we can write a test for it. So now every system has a slightly different way of doing this, but in Jest, the way that you do it is you make a file that is named in a similar way to the file that you're testing. So if I'm testing sum.js, I'm going to call this file sum.test.js. And this is what it looks like. So the first thing I do is I pull in the sum module. Now this is a really important idea. In order to test your code, you're going to have, sorry, let me back up. In order to test your code in a modular way, you're going, or in order to zoom in and test one piece of your code, it's going to be necessary for you to write your code so that you can pull pieces of it apart. So if your code is just one big function, you know, it's all one file and it's just step one, step two, steps three, step four, it's very difficult to test that without testing the whole thing because there's no way to, to just get the sum function out of the middle of that thing. But if you write your code so that you can import or you can use other uh, modules, packages, pieces, whatever the terminology is, uh, classes, if you can use those things from deep in your program, separate from the program, then we can start to reason about how the internal parts of our, our code work. So I pull in the sum function from the sum module, and then what's going to happen is we're going to write a test. So now every testing framework that you're going to use is going to have some way for you to write a test. So it's often going to be a function or a class that you have to subclass, or it's going to be some particular syntax that you have to use. And that's going to allow the test runner that you're using, so in my case, Jest, to go and execute this. So really what I'm doing is Jest wants me to write a function. And the function basically has a name. So what's the name of the test? And the function also has a callback function. And this is where my assertions exist. So this test says that if you add 1 plus 2, you should get 3. And so what we have here, the next thing is we have, a, we have, an, we have an assertion. So in the language of Jest, we use expect. But again, it'll be different depending on what you're using. But we have some way to say that if you execute this function, sum 1, 2, then we assert that the value should be 3. If the value is 3, then this test has passed. However, if the value is 4, then this test is going to fail. And so Jest is going to take care of running this test, deciding whether or not the test has passed the assertion, and then it's going to give you back a report and say, this test has passed or this test has failed.
So on the surface, tests are really simple. And I, I like how simple this test is. This test tests one thing. So it doesn't test 50 different situations that you could have. It just tests one thing. Now, you might say to yourself, well, how many tests do I need? Do you have to test every single number in order to know that your sum function works? Well, probably not. But you may find that there's particular numbers that cause you problems. So later on, you might find that negative numbers are a problem. Or you might find that floating point numbers are a problem, right? So you're going to have to add more tests. And each of those tests is going to test something different than the previous test did. So you want your test to be worth writing. Don't write another test that does 2 plus 2 and another test that does 4 plus 4 because you're not testing anything new. It's only when you discover, okay, what happens if I test, what if I call sum with null and 1? So maybe that's a case that you care about. One of the things you're going to find is that if you're working with a dynamic language that, that doesn't have types, like JavaScript, for example, you're going to end up writing more tests because there are certain things that are just impossible in a language like C++ or Java where you have strong, strong type language that you have to deal with at runtime in a language like JavaScript. So you tend to, you tend to see more of those kinds of tests here. Okay, so we need a way with our test runner to be able to call it. And in uh, the case of Jest with a um, JavaScript with a JavaScript application, you're going to do that by adding a script to your uh, to your package.json file, which is going to call Jest. And when Jest runs, what it's going to do is it's going to find all of the tests and it's going to report to you and say this test passed or this test failed. And um, You'll be able to you'll be able to make adjustments based on um, based on how that goes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this and I'm going to come back in the next video. What I'll do is I will give you a tour of the code that I've written and show you how it works quickly, and then I will take you through testing it and talk about strategies for how I would do unit testing snapshot testing, end-to-end -end testing. I'm going to show you a bunch of different types of tests that I would uh, write in order to do this. And then in um, a follow-up from that, we will look at how to automate testing that for every pull request. We're going to look at how to do continuous integration and how do we integrate that into GitHub. So I'm going to pause this here and we'll, I'll come back in the next one with a tour of the code.